All right, if you would take out your message outline for today. Does anybody remember what happened on November 3rd of 2019? We were standing in our backyard, and we were awaiting a gender reveal party, Christy and Ryan, and we were celebrating before the announcement of not just the baby, what kind of baby, and then we celebrated when the gun went off and the pink uh, uh, pieces of paper went flying into the air and all over my backyard. And that brought us to tears. And then we celebrated and ate wildly afterwards uh, after the announcement of the gender reveal. Uh, that story sort of caps, encapsulates Chris, the Christmas story. We anticipate, as, as uh, you heard with the, with the, uh, unit, or the candle today, uh, Advent candle, we anticipate the hope of what's coming. We celebrate ahead of time. Uh, on Christmas, they celebrated there at the manger and out in the fields, and we celebrate ever since then. Uh, Christmas, I'd like to, to say four things about Christmas today that the gospel does. Number one, it's rooted in history. Christmas is rooted in history. Uh, when Matthew starts off his gospel, he doesn't start off with the cute little manger scene uh, or the shepherds out in the field watching their flocks by night. He starts off with a, a section of scripture that if you ever get tired at night, but you can't go to sleep and you need something to help put you to sleep, Matthew 1 through, 7, 1 through 17 is your ticket. Uh, it's the genealogy of, of Jesus all, going all the way back to, into the book of Genesis. It starts off a record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. He takes it all the way back there, about 2,000 years. And then he rolls forward. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. And this continues for 42 generations. Uh, if you've been a Bible student for a while, you will probably recognize about half the names in there. And unless you are a, a professor of theology, there are about half those names you are not going to recognize at all. And I have spared you the humor of laughing at me as I try to pronounce all of those names. We get down to verse 17. Thus there were 14 generations in all from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Christ. Now, one of the questions that I've wondered in the past is why such a long period of time? We started back with even in Genesis 3 after the uh, sin of Adam and Eve, and then we jumped to Genesis 12 and Genesis 15, the Abrahamic covenant of a Messiah to come through Abraham. Why 2,000 years? Well, one of the things that's happened in human history is that there have been men who have uh, proclaimed themselves a Messiah or God in the flesh, and it's one thing to, uh, to claim that. It's quite another thing to substantiate that claim. And for all these folks, uh, their, their bones have long since turned to dust somewhere, usually over in the Middle East. But with the genealogy for over 2,000 years, we have an incredible stacking of evidence that is irrefutable and can be checked. We don't need Ancestry.com in order to do this. Uh, we can, the Jewish uh, people who have written with great detail their generational history have done all that work for us. Uh, it's traceable. And so one of the things that's cool about the genealogy in, in Matthew and in Luke is that in real time back in Genesis and moving forward, there were the promises repeated to every generation of a Messiah to come through the line of Abraham and then Isaac and then Jacob all the way down. And they, they were based on the promises and the faithfulness of God that anchored them. But then when Jesus comes, you can look backwards instead of forwards and corroborate, is it, is it just like he said it would be through the line of Abraham uh, and David, etc. Uh, Mary, uh, when the angel comes to tell her about the birth of the, the baby, she remembers this very point. And in Luke chapter 1, 54, she replies, he has remembered to be merciful to Abraham 2,000 years prior. 
The people knew about the genealogy. They knew about the hope that was coming. Even Mary did. Now, one of the things that this does for me, rooted in history, is that, uh, we'll talk about this in a minute, is it gives me a tremendous amount of rest in my heart. Because the, the story of God is, is unbroken. It was unbroken through flood and famine, unbroken through disease and drought, uh, unbroken through pestilence and poverty, uh, unbroken through uh, slavery, unbroken through war, exile of two nations, uh, sieges, unbroken through personal sin of important people and national sin of uh, God's people, and yet the story keeps going. God's larger story continues unbroken through all of that, and that gives us rest in our hearts. Christmas is rooted in history. Second, Christmas is good news, and it's good news from God's point of view, especially because it's a rescue operation. A rescue operation was begun back in Genesis 3, and the rescuer now is, uh, can be found there in that manger. In Luke chapter 2, verse 8, we have the familiar story. There were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news. One of the things I love about good news is that usually when we hear good news, something has already happened. Now, occasionally, good news, we're, we're happy about good news because we anticipate something is going to happen. That's partly true with the incarnation. But what the angels are saying is something has already happened. And it, and it brings great joy for all the people. Everybody has a chance to be a part of this particular story. Verse 11. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. Not just a baby has been born, but a Savior. A very unlikely Savior, a baby. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And this is the heart of the gospel. God saw our desperate need all the way back in Genesis 3, all through the course of 2,000 years of human history, and set about a rescue operation to do for us what we could not do for us, and that is to change our human nature, to make us right with God and right with other people. Uh, third, Christmas is good news, particularly to sinners like me. Now, imagine if you were going to write a resume, uh, and, and let's say you've been through about five jobs already, but this time you were going to write a resume that was actually true, and not all dude it up with a lot of makeup and, uh, and some good intentions. Imagine writing this resume. In my first job, I was habitually late getting all my major projects done. Nobody's going to put that on their resume. In my second job, HR discovered that I really didn't have an MBA from Harvard. In my third job, I had a moral failure and was canned. The moral failure was with the CEO's wife. And fourth, I just got out of prison for embezzlement in my last job. But now I'd like you to hire me, and I'd like a fresh start in life. Now, of course, nobody's going to hire you if you wrote that kind of resume. Now, 2,000 years ago, uh, there was no such thing as a resume. The closest thing they had was their family tree, or, or the list of people that were their ancestors, and famous people uh, uh, dolled, dolled up their uh, ancestry tree the same way that we doll up our resume. There were some people in the family tree that they just didn't mention so that nobody else would mention them. Now, when it comes to the genealogy of Jesus, this is the exact opposite. They've done the equivalent here of writing the resume that I just sort of said that nobody would ever do. In Hillary Clinton's famous words, the, 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 uh, in Matthew 1, there's a long list of deplorables, and it, it includes five women who no culture 2,000 years ago would have included in a way to doll up your resume. Five women. And I'd like to, uh, to highlight those five women here. Matthew 1, 3 says, Judah, who was the grandfather of, uh, grandson of Abraham, the father of Perez and Zerah, 
whose mother was Tamar. There's our first woman. Who is Tamar? Well, she was Judah's daughter-in-law. And a couple thousand years ago, in the Hebrew, in the Isra Israel's culture, whenever a woman became a widow, uh, she was then without property because all the property went through the, the male line in each of the different uh, tribes of Israel. And so to protect the women and to give them uh, property rights, the second, the next son down was obligated to marry the widow so that the property line, which she would still have property uh, and, and an income through the course of her life. Um, now, when uh, Tamar's uh, husband, Judah's son, died, uh, there was the, the next youngest son was a, a little guy, you know, about like maybe uh, uh, Jenna's age. And, uh, and so it's going to be a long time before this little fella, you know, grew up. But, but Judah promised Tamar that when he does, when he does grow up, then uh, he'll marry you and you'll have property rights again. Now, when that time came, uh, Judah went back on his word. And uh, when Tamar heard about that, she was uh, quite mad. Uh, and vengeful, and she decided that she was not only going to get her revenge, but she was still going to get her property rights. What did she do? She dressed, she heard that Judah was traveling. She dressed up as a prostitute with a, a low cap and a low and a high veil, dressed up as a prostitute on his route, and uh, seduced him. And then uh, there at night, uh, in the cover of darkness, uh, without any light or filtered light, um, they uh, had intercourse, and she gave birth, as uh, Matthew records here, uh, to Perez and Zara, uh, Tamar. Uh, if you were going to write uh, your resume through genealogy, you would never add somebody who dressed up uh, as a prostitute and committed incest with her father-in-law. This wouldn't do that. Uh, but Tamar is included here. Next, next woman. Matthew 1, 5, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Rahab. Rahab was a harlot. Uh, and she became a very famous woman because when the two Hebrew spies uh, went to spy out the land uh, in Jericho, uh, she hid them from being captured and made a promise that uh, when the people took over Jericho that they would spare her life and her family, which they did. Now, this particular woman, who was a harlot, ended up becoming a woman of faith to such an extent that she's included in Hebrews 11 in the great chapter of people of faith. But if you were writing a resume, it was all polished up, you would never include Rahab. The next one in verse 5 is uh, Ruth. Uh, Ruth was a Gentile, a Moabitess, and the Hebrew people looked at um, the Gentiles as, as sort of the equivalent of wild dogs, uh, not really human. Again, in the Jewish culture, you would never, 2,000 years ago, write uh, a Gentile into this story. Uh, and then in Matthew 1, 6, Jesse, the father of King David, David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife, otherwise known as Bathsheba. Uh, now, I wonder, now why, why didn't they include Bathsheba here? Um, and that would have been, you know, a, another story of, wow, you know, even Bathsheba's included here. But I think that Grace went even deeper on this particular line here by not including Bathsheba, but saying had been Uriah's wife. Who was Uriah? Uriah was one of David's 30 men, 30 mighty men, and he had been a fiercely loyal subject to King David. And while Uriah was off uh, at war and David was home, he uh, connived to be able to commit adultery with Bathsheba. And then when, it found, when they found out she was pregnant, he arranged for Uriah's death on the front lines. So uh, this is about as low and deplorable uh, as you can get. And yet, so it's, you know, this is the unvarnished truth of the lineage of Jesus. And the fifth woman in Matthew 1.16 Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus. I thought that Mary was probably an older teenager uh, when the angel came to her. And uh, how would you explain that you were pregnant but not yet married? Well, you can imagine what the town gossip was and the whispers around. 
And yet Mary is also included here. And we know that, uh, that she wasn't, that the baby wasn't born out of wedlock as we think of this. But think about these five women in, included and, and imagine the, the unvarnished truth of this genealogy. You have a woman who committed incest, a woman who was a former harlot, a woman who was a Gentile, a woman who was an adulteress, and a woman who everyone thought had a baby out of wedlock. Now, what does this say to me about the gospel? This is why it's good news for all people. It's hard, it's hard to, to take a list of people that were more um, deplorable uh, or at the bottom end of morality than some of the people listed. And I've only listed the, the five women here. Uh, it's good news. And then finally, it's an invitation to rest. The gospel is an invitation to rest. Henry David Thoreau uh, lived in the 1800s, and he had the famous quote that uh, massive men lead lives of quiet desperation. And I believe that's true. But here, here's the uh, fuller quote. The massive men lead lives of quiet desperation. What is called resignation is confirmed desperation. From the desperate city, you go into the desperate country and have to console yourself with the bravery, bravery of minks and muskrats. A stereotyped but unconscious despair is concealed, even under what are called the games and amusements of mankind. There is no play in them. This comes after work. But it is characteristic of wisdom not to do desperate things. A very important quote. Now, it's for people who have a frantic heart or a restless heart or busy, busy, busy out in the world and busy, busy, busy in their heart that are looking for that something missing. And what they're looking for is a heart that can be at rest. That it's okay to be me. It's okay to be me as a sinner. It's okay for me to be a forgiven sinner. It's okay that I am a part of the, of the family of God as a child. And it's on that basis that there's something in my heart that can rest. Hebrews 4.1 says, Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. Uh, this rest comes through Jesus Christ and what he accomplished at Christmas for us and then at, at, uh, at Calvary. Verse 2, we also have had the gospel preached to us just as they did. Now here he's talking about the Old Testament people who are in the wilderness that never did enter God's rest during a 40-year uh, excursion around uh, the Sinai Peninsula. We also have had that gospel preached to us just as they did, but the message they heard was of no value to them because those who heard it did not combine it with faith. Now, what's he saying? How do we enter rest? We enter rest not because we acknowledge the truth of the gospel, but, be, but, the, but by anchoring ourselves in the truth of the gospel. Just to acknowledge the truth of the gospel is not going to give me any rest in my heart at all. It's not until I am anchoring myself saying, I am going to live my life based on what God has done for me, that I can finally be at rest. Because that is unchangeable. Now, why did these folks, it said they did not enter rest because they, they heard a message but did not combine it with faith. Well, what did they do instead? Well, they did what we do. They looked for something to find rest for their heart outside of them instead of inside of them. Something they could do rather than something only God could do. Uh, they trusted in uh, their husband or their wife or their children or their parents or their, uh, their work or their ac accomplishments or their achievements, the kind of things that, that we do. They trusted in finite and futile people like us. And none of these things can bring rest to our hearts. Instead, what these things do is they add pressure and stress. And sometimes you feel like you're on a treadmill trying to keep everybody happy. That is not a recipe for rest. Instead, we trust in what God has done for us. That there's something inside that he's done that gives us rest. Verse 3, we who have believed 
enter that rest. When it finally is all said and done, I can go home and rest this afternoon in my heart because of what Jesus has done for me. And there's nothing that I can do to add to that. Now, on the back of your handout, um, I have spent the last uh, 48 years slowly changing and still trying to change from trusting what I can do and what, how people treat me or what I can accomplish for my rest to trust in God. And that has been a long uh, 48 years of continuing to do that. And every week, it's the same story. So I've included a few of my favorite verses in here that I often remind myself. 2 Corinthians 10, 18. It is not the one who commends himself who is approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. Even if I were to get it all right, would still not be enough. Anything short of that, of course, would not be enough either. Proverbs 29, 25. Fear of man will prove to be a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is kept safe. Fear of man meaning if I am trusting what someone thinks about me for my sense of value, um, it will prove to be a snare, a trap. We have a rat trap in our backyard. I've caught one. It's not getting out of that trap. John 2, 24. Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all men. He did not need man's testimony about man, for he knew what was in a man. He knew it's impossible for us to find our value in terms of what people think. Even if we get everything right, it just is not going to happen. Well, these are four things that strike me as we, as we begin our Christmas season about Christmas that it's rooted in history, a long history of the faithfulness and promise of God that can be corroborated. Secondly, that Christmas is a rescue operation from God's point of view. And from our point of view, it's exactly what we need to be rescued from our human nature. And then fourth is that it promises to give us rest that our hearts need most. And eternal rest doesn't just begin when I die. Eternal rest can begin now. 1 John 5, 11 through 13 says, This is the testimony that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who has not the Son of God has not life. I write this to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. That you may know you have eternal life. An invitation has been given to all of us. And with that invitation is an RSVP. And it's to do exactly what John talked about here. Now I have a, a Bible here. Nathan, would you, uh, would you hold this, come up and hold this for me? All right. Um, now I have my sermon notes uh, in my hand here, uh, brightly colored as you can tell. And um, the, uh, and Nathan has a Bible, and uh, Nathan, uh, I'm going to ask you to ask me for these sermon notes. Right. Uh, can I have the sermon notes? Yes, you may. Would you place them in the Bible, please? In fact, would you fold them in half and tuck them into the Bible so that they can't be seen? Now, to all the world, it looks like Nathan has what? A Bible. But Nathan knows there's something else in that Bible. What's, what's in that Bible? Sermon. Sermon notes. And if Nathan has the Bible, he also has the sermon notes. This is what the verse we just read, 1 John 5, 11 to 13. He who has the Son, the sermon notes, or the Bible, has the life. That's the sermon notes. He who has the Son has the life. He who has not the Son of God has no sermon notes, has not the life. Thank you, Nathan. Father, we thank you for Christmas and the promise of Christmas, the hope that we have uh, as we celebrate today with the Advent candle and the Advent wreath. Thank you for the... Uh, 
the wonder of who Jesus is, the wonder of your story to send your son to die in our place on the greatest rescue mission ever undertaken for people highly undeserving like us and many of the people in Matthew chapter 1 genealogy. But we thank you that we are anchored and that we are people who can enjoy a rest in our heart that does not depend on our circumstances or on people or even our own, uh, how well we, we think we're doing. We thank you for the salvation that you offer. This verse in 1 John 5, 11 to 13 talks about that we can know that we have eternal life. It's not up for speculation. And so my question to you is, is that, do you know that true for you? Do you know with certainty that you have given your heart to Jesus Christ as best as you know how to do that? And if you have done that, then the life, eternal life that is in Jesus now resides in you. And on that basis, you can know with certainty and assurance you have eternal life. If you are not sure, you can do that right now. Just pray a simple prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I... I really don't know if I've ever really given my heart to you. But I, re I do so right now. Thank you for coming in my behalf, dying in my behalf, suffering, rising in my behalf to, to pay for the penalty for my sin. And as best I know, I yield myself to you and ask you to come into my life. And based upon that promise that you've given, I thank you that even now I have eternal life and assurance of that forever. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.